So it is important to uh, know that I'm actually somebody who's been into bicycling and bicycles for ages, for at least, you know, 35 years, yikes. I've, I've built up bicycles. Um, I have multiple bicycles in my basement, including a tricycle. But um, I never really considered an e-bike until recently because I realized that with an e-bike, the most important piece here is that I could arrive to my destination without being all sweaty. Not only that, it really would be just as fast to take an e-bike to my office or to the classroom than it would be to take my minivan because I can actually cut through campus. Um, and e-bikes can go 25 miles per hour, which is essentially the speed that I'm going when I'm in my minivan on the, uh, the roads. So the only issue then is there are a myriad of e-bikes that exist out there. After a month of research, I realized that there are actually nine basic categories of e-bike from which to choose. And before you can actually pick a particular e-bike, you need to first determine which category you're interested in falling into. And so that's what this video is about. It's about carrying you through these nine different categories to help you determine which category you should focus in on. And the way that I want to help you to sort this out is to use a metaphor to help you understand what these categories stand for. And I'm going to use the metaphor of cars. Just like we have different categories of cars, we have sports cars, sport utilities, pickup trucks, etc. I'm going to do the same thing when it comes to e-bikes because I do feel like they actually fit pretty nicely into car categories in terms of their both their style and their functionality. These typically range in price from about $3,500 to $15,000 US dollars, which is crazy. That's like the price of a used car. The car that I would use, or the car category, eh, no, the car that I would use to equate this e-bike category with would be the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon right there. An example of a performance mountain e-bike is this guy right here. Um, so unlike analog mountain bikes that can be used for commuting, um, both you know city commuting to get to work as well as to cruise around campus on, we see them all over the place here on our campus. Um, a true performance e-bike is way too expensive and frankly it's just overkill to use it as a commuting uh, bicycle. Um, since legit ones like this guy right here start at around six thousand dollars, so this is the the Trek Rail 700. And unless you're primarily using the thing for actual mountain biking, and, and we're talking when I, when I say actual mountain biking, where you hit technical single track on every weekend um, and you're you know cruising through trees, etc. Why would you spend so much money on a bike that's designed for cutting through groves of maple trees when you're going to spend most of your time cruising around on Maple Avenue. So don't do it. Don't be foolish. All right. So for category number two, we have another performance bike. This is the performance road e-bike. Um, and these are similarly priced, although they're a little bit lower end uh, ones that are a little bit cheaper. So we're talking about um, $3,500 to $15,000. And for this, in terms of the, the car equivalent, I would say that this is like the McLaren F1 that you see right here, this beauty of a car. And this is the, it's the Specialized Turbo Creo SL Comp Carbon. Um, this is $6,000, so obviously not cheap. And it's exactly the same concept here as the Performance Mountain Bikes, um, but arguably even more impractical, frankly, because um, road bikes are about speed and agility and fundamentally, they're not super comfortable or versatile things. They're made for one thing, which is to move fast on a nice smooth road. Um, and that lightness is actually, how light they are, is, is really critical. Um, in fact, it's almost the antithesis of a road bike to have it be an e-bike. Number one, because you're there to try to get exercise if you're using a road bike. And number two, you want it to be super light. And the componentry of the, the electric motor and the battery make it so much heavier than it needs to be. Um, these range in price from uh, a low of $800 to around $2,600. And the, um, the car that I think best fits this category 
is this guy right here. This is the 1965 Ford Country Squire station wagon with wood paneling. Look at that lovely thing. This, uh, this is the Bike Tricks Stunner Step Through, number five, I think it is. And these are definitely, as you can see here, retro looking bikes that um, I picture being ridden by people on boardwalks in New Jersey. Truthfully, I really can't imagine anyone under the age of 50 pedaling around with one of these things. Now, I'm over 50, so I think I could get away with it, but um, you know, maybe only if I was on a beach vacation would I want to cruise around on this. And that's mainly because um, they kind of look funny in my mind. They do potentially make great commuters uh, because they do have sort of a more upright positioning when you're on them, and that allows you to look around. And they don't look very techy, so Frankly, they um, probably won't get stolen if you have to lock it up in an area where it's not uh, terribly safe. Actually, you know, I'm probably not giving this segment enough credit for the way that they look. Uh, I could actually imagine Audrey Hepburn cruising around in one of these things in Paris and, you know, hitting her little bell and waving to all of her fans as she goes by. So they, they do kind of have a, a cool retro look to them that I think some, some might like. So this next category, number four, is actually sort of complex. It's the moped slash mini bike style of e-bikes. And you can find these bikes for around $2,000 up to around $5,000. And it's not really a car that I'm gonna use as a metaphor because frankly, these things are designed for something that definitely existed in the past or most of us are familiar with, which is mopeds. In fact, the 1980 Pook moped that you see right here is one that I actually owned when I was a kid. And you can see that this right here, this is an e-bike version. It's called the Juiced Hyper Scorpion Express. This one is uh, $2,900. It seriously, you can see that it, it really looks a heck of a lot like that original Pook, 1980s Pook moped. The thing is that if you ever had to pedal that Pook moped, it was an awful experience. Uh, the bikes themselves, well, the mopeds, were super heavy. The gearing was all wrong, so you spun like crazy to move a, a short amount of distance. Um, and those same pedaling issues actually also applied in, in a different way to e-mopeds. You can't, number one, you can't raise the seat. Um, let me go back to this image here. And notice here, that where the bike seat is, it's not on a post, so it's fixed in place. Now, it does happen to be the case with this Juiced uh, Hyper Scorpion Express that you can purchase from their website, um, something that raises the seat a couple of inches. And the reason why those exist is that it makes your pedaling stroke more efficient because you can, you know, you don't have to have such a bent knee as you're pedaling through. In order to get the top speed from an e-bike, you actually do have to pedal. And by top speed, I mean the ones that go on, they go past what's called a, a class three, um, which means that it can go faster than 20 miles per hour. Usually you can't just do that with the throttle. Usually you have to actually put some effort into it to get to go above the 20 miles per hour. The great thing about this segment, however, and you should notice here with, with this example, is that they have 20 inch fat tires and full suspensions, both rear and front full suspensions which adds a huge amount of comfort and performance to these bikes. Um, they also typically have larger batteries, they have larger motors, which allow them to not only go faster, as I said, they can go to class three, um, but usually that means it improves their range. Although that's not always the case because another big problem with these guys is that they are super heavy. They typically are around 100 pounds, if not more. And so if you have to lug around that much weight, um, you're going to be inefficient in terms of its battery use. There's also a mini bike version of these, um, these types of bikes, which is why I said this was moped slash mini bike. And these two are pretty cool looking. This is the Super 73 S2 Urban Cruiser, and it's about $3,000. You can tell these are more motorbike looking than they are moped looking. They remind me a lot of vintage, say, 1950 Honda motorbikes like this guy right here. Except for the fact that it's got that strange gap in the middle. Um, so here, let me show that side by side. Do you see how it's got that big opening in the triangle? That feels super empty. Like they need to put something there. It just looks, it, to me, it looks very odd. It's, 
it looks a lot like that bad dream that I have where I go to work and I realize once I get to work that I'm not wearing pants. It looks like the, that's what this thing reminds me of. They don't look like the kinds of things that you would have on greenways, like converted uh, railways or converted towpaths, because they look like they belong on the road as traditional mopeds and motorbikes. And so I would imagine you would get some nasty looks from people who are driving by on their bicycles because they think that you're in, a, in the wrong place. Like get yourself onto the, the pavement with the cars, bub. The 27.5 refers to the size of the wheel that's associated with this. And so, and, and this is the Toyota Corolla of e-bikes. So here's an example. This is this is the Rad City 5 Plus of about $2,000 here. And they are sort of what I think of as the cross bike segment of the market. And, and I don't mean cyclocross bikes, which have morphed into now gravel bikes, which are super popular. I'm talking about the cross bikes of the early 90s that were the proverbial jack of all trades, master of none. But, but I will tell you this, that I think that these e-bikes that you see here, these city e-bikes, actually are pretty masterful when it comes to commuting. Um, so being on city streets is where they can dominate. Um, the tires are lighter, uh, they tend to be narrower, you can pump them up to higher pressure so it makes them that much more efficient in terms of the rolling resistance. Um, and so because of that they actually um, the battery life is better on these things and they can be pretty speedy as, as a result. The other thing is that they tend to be big enough so that they can carry larger batteries and have larger motors associated with them. Um, most of them even, as you can see this one does, have front shocks um, which do sort of soften the blow of a, a pothole that you may not see until the last second. Um, they universally sport fenders as well, so if you're cruising through the rain or even after the rain going through a puddle you're not going to get your um, your new suit all soiled and the other piece here is that you can see it has a rack most of them do come with racks it's rare that they don't come with racks and so um, you know you can affix your bag onto the back of that rack and of course you'd need to have a basket or bungee cords or something to do that now the only issue I have is that they don't look particularly good to me um, I, I've always found it odd that you have such skinny little tires and wispy looking handlebars and stems and really fat looking frames, especially the down tube that carries that battery. It just to me has that look of a guy with a really big beer belly and really skinny legs. And so I can't help it when I see these city bikes. I, I don't find them to be aesthetically all that pleasing. They, they don't have that sort of the elegance of those, um, the cruiser bikes that I uh, showed earlier. Um, and they don't have that sort of rugged boldness of the, the next category that we're gonna look at. So let's take a look at that next category, number six. Twenty-six refers to the size of the wheel on these guys. Before those the city bike one was 27.5. 26 is obviously it's a smaller wheel. But overall, the wheels are actually not smaller because these tend to have fat tires, which is why these are called the fat 26ers. The car that I think is equivalent to, to these guys is the Land Rover Range Rover, but not the new Land Rover Range Rover, which are like luxury mobiles. We're talking about the ones in the 1970s that were really rugged. And these are masculine, beefy, heavy, powerful things. And they're really popular because they can do so much and you look good doing it as well. So they actually are pretty versatile things and so are these e-bikes. Um, the ethos of these fat tire 26ers are really all about doing a lot of things in a rugged way. They actually tend to be very stable because of those big fat tires, but they're not quite as agile as the performance mountain e-bikes. So you wouldn't be able to really use them off-road, even though they look like they're great for off-road, it would be very limited off-road use. If you're using a performance mountain e-bike, you would definitely be using that for you know, some gnarly single track, all right, going up and down steep slopes, you know, taking air with it, basically. Whereas these guys are much more ground-based. Um, they're gonna be great for cruising along fire roads up mountains, uh, nothing too steep. Um, but they would do that really well because they can go on, on roads that are not paved, but they can also go on roads that are perfectly paved. 
Um, and it's that sort of those large volume, very grippy tires that allow it to do that sort of thing. As well as you can see here, they almost always have front suspension with them. So the geometry isn't quite as quick and nimble as a, a performance mountain bike, but it, it's pretty close there. The one issue, however, with these fatties is that they are super conspicuous. Those big old tires with large volumes there, um, uh, they really, they stand out. You, people notice them. And this one right here is the uh, Unirau Fat HD. It goes for about 2,500 bucks. It looks cool, um, but keep in mind that if you're primarily gonna be using this around town and as a commuter, you're gonna get looks because it looks so different. People might... This next category, category seven, is really interesting. Um, these are the cargo e-bikes, and they range from uh, 1,700 bucks all the way up to seven grand. They can get pretty expensive. And uh, when I think of these cargo e-bikes, I think of, it's, it's actually a hard one to pin down exactly, but I would say they're kind of like the, the Chevy Silverado 1500 pickup truck with the extended cab. Um, but they can also just as easily morph into, which sounds odd, a Toyota Sienna minivan. Um, and that's because they, as you can see with this guy right here, the cargo bikes have an extended bed. And so this is where you really need to be thinking about the, um, the Silverado pickup truck. Um, and they never used to be, they, they existed for a long time without being e-bikes, but they were never super popular. It wasn't until they became e-bikes that they became popular because instead of having to use your legs to haul around that extra metal, um, you could have the, the motor actually do it for you. And it's not just the extra metal. You would only get these cargo bikes because you'd probably be carrying something. This actually makes this thing ideal for doing things like carrying your kids around um, or using it as a, a last mile delivery service vehicle um, or even to pick up a full load of groceries. You could put a big basket on the back of that, put all your groceries in, into that basket and easily transport them home. So what we have here, this is the, the Turn GSD, which is, I, I can't remember which model it is, something like the LX Ranger. It's pretty expensive, it's 5,800 bucks. That's because it has a mid-drive motor on it and so those are a lot more expensive. Um, but there are some others that actually, like this guy, and this, do, this has an extended front cab area. And so this is what I think of actually as being more like the minivan because that front cab area, you could just plunk your kids in there, you could put soccer balls in there. There's any number of things you could put into that giant bucket there. Um, and so this is the Yuba Super Cargo CL, and it's six grand. And, um, but again, pretty heavy beasts these are, and they require large motors and big batteries. Um, and so as a result, they can be pretty pricey, although they're not all super pricey. There is one that is uh, incredibly reasonable made by KBO. It's called the KBO Ranger. And that guy is, I think, 1700 bucks, so it's a total deal. You know, these are great bikes if you're planning on hauling stuff around, whether it's your kids or actually goods. Um, but if you ever envision going out on your own, say in early morning, just to before the traffic comes out to take a nice ride, these are not really great uh, because they're not super flexible in terms of what they can do. They're not fast. They're not very agile. Um, so there'd be there are a lot more bikes out there that would be more versatile, that would allow you to still sort of carry maybe one kid instead of two and a little bit of cargo, but not a lot, and still be fun to use on the road. And I'll get to that in just a bit. So the cargo bikes, uh, they really do have a very specific functionality to them. Um, okay, this is category number eight, and this is the folding e-bikes category. And you're gonna find a folding e-bike for as little as $1,000 to as high as five grand. And I like to equate this category with something like the electric Mini Cooper. Um, this is one of the hottest segments of the market uh, because when you think about this, e-bikes are great in cities as replacements for a car or for a car or public transportation. However, uh, think about this, every now and then you take a ride and then you need to come back on the subway or you need to get an Uber. And if you have one of these e-bikes, you can fold it all up, just like you can see here, 
and it makes it into a much more compact bundle that you can put into the trunk of the car or you can have sitting beside you when you're riding in the, on the subway car. Um, and then not only that, but when you get back to your tiny little apartment or even to your office if you're using it as a commuter, you can pack that thing up and actually put it in a place that doesn't take up too much room in your home or in your office. Um, so, you know, that, have, being able to fold up into a tiny package like you can, you can see here with this GoCycle G4, which is five grand by the way, so this is one of the ones that it's at, at the top of the price point. Um, that's really a boon for bringing it with you everywhere. Similarly, for those people who are adopting sort of, what do we call that? The nomadic lifestyle, where they're, um, you know, conversion vans and um, RV life, these are also great because obviously you don't have a lot of room in those vehicles for uh, something like a full-size bike. So if you can fold it up and put it into a small little corner of your RV or your conversion van, that's just perfect. And it really does become a great extension of that uh, adventure exploration life that those folks like to, to um, dig into. And then on top of that, you know, when I think about for the suburban mom or dad, it even works there as well, because instead of having to take out your bike rack and attach it to the back of your Honda Accord, you can just pop open the trunk, fold this thing up and chuck it into the Honda and then drive to where you want to go and then take it out, unfold it and bicycle around whatever park or wherever you're going. I think that this segment is probably the one that's probably going to explode because who wouldn't want to have something that has this level of versatility? So I wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of years uh, we have a lot more options in the folding uh, e-bike category. The only thing I will warn you against here is that there are a ton of these available on Amazon and through eBay. And I really want to caution you against just getting those ones because they're cheap and they're easy to find because they're on eBay and Amazon. You really want to get one of these from a reputable company. And that does mean you're going to have to pay a little more for that. Um, but because these are folding bikes, you don't want to have that folding mechanism suddenly fail on you halfway through a ride when you're going 20 miles per hour. That's we have the utility e-bike. And these have a price range of between $1,500 to $5,000. And the, um, the equivalent car, I would say, for this guy is something like the Subaru Forester. Here's an example of uh, one such utility e-bike and these bikes um, have quite an appeal in my mind they have they're sort of a cross between the fat tire 26er e-bike and the cargo e-bikes in terms of what they offer however because they universally have the 20 inch fat tire wheels on them fat tires and wheels on them which are similar to the ones that you find in many of the folding bikes it makes these much more compact than either the Fatty 26ers or the cargo e-bikes. Um, and you can see here that with this one, this is the, uh, the Espen Nesta and it's $1,600. And I want you to think of these as the, the true do-it-all bikes, uh, but not like the, what I remember how I disparaged the cross bikes earlier as being sort of the jack of all trades, master of none. Well, these really can do it all in my mind. Um, in fact, I dare say that the utility bike is the perfect evolution of the e-bike form altogether. If you need to pick up groceries, you can put a basket on the back of that and do that. It's um, designed to let you do some light hauling. So you can even put a child or even a, an adult on the back of some of these things, as long as you have what they call them, second rider packages. Um, and then if you want to just go for a joy ride, uh, where you're just cruising either on the road or even off the road, you can do that too because it's not super heavy or unwieldy. It's actually kind of nimble because of the 20-inch the tires. Um, it's also relatively light compared to the, the cargo bike and the, um, the Fatty 26ers. And um, so it, it allows it to have significant, relatively higher power as well as relatively higher range so it can go for longer. Um, it can handle all sorts of surfaces. Uh, it can go through mud, snow, uh, loose gravel, etc. Um, so, and not only that, an important thing to consider here is that those fat tires—they're they're twenty—they're twenty inch, not twenty-six inch fat tires. 
uh, they actually can be run at relatively or very low pressures. And so they actually, because they are squishier, together with the, um, for the front suspension, these can actually have a really compliant, comfortable ride associated with them. If you want it to be more efficient, you just simply pump up the tires to a higher pressure. And if you're just going to be on the road, and then you can actually extend your mileage. So lots of flexibility here. I would say that the, the last thing that really makes this an attractive option is that it actually looks attractive. These things look like no other bike uh, that exists, whether it's an analog bike or an e-bike. Um, and so it actually, it doesn't look like it doesn't belong. And I think that's one of the things that's important for you to consider here. You could imagine very easily using this as a commuter. I could imagine cruising through campus on this without getting a second look. I could even imagine riding it on a road right next to other cars because it has sort of a little bit of a more rugged look to it. Um, and, you know, it doesn't get a lot of attention for being totally ostentatious, nor does it get a lot of looks because it looks completely dorky. Well, I mean, actually, it, it does have a little bit of dorkiness to it, but it's an acute, approachable way that it's dorkiness. Um, so in this way, this utility e-bike category is the bike that I am actually most interested in. It's the one that I'm going to be digging into to find a bike that works for me. And I really would urge most of you who are looking at this video, if you've made it this far, I would say that you start right here. Start with this utility bike type. Um, and uh, in fact, what you're gonna see in my next video is the algorithm that I use to select my utility e-bike. Um, I have a selection of utility e-bikes. I collected a whole bunch of data and then I use that data to help drive which one would be the one I would go for. So take a look for that video. And in the meantime, I promise you, I will get back to doing backpack videos. And um, I don't know when, but I will do that um, after I do the video on which e-bike I selected. And probably another video after that when the e-bike comes in and I show you um, what it's all about. All right, crew, stay COVID safe out there. And I'm um, looking forward to the warmth spring here in New England. It's a little nasty out there. You can't tell because it's overexposed, but it's actually snowing out there. And it is what? It's uh, March 12th at this point. For goodness sakes, I want spring. All right, folks, take it easy. Bye-bye.